Hello and welcome to NOV Live. I'm Michael Gaines, host of the podcast NOV Today, and glad you are joining us today as we have another conversation about technology in the energy space and uh, really, uh, really diving in and getting your questions and uh, getting you connected with uh, technical experts to uh, bring some insight into the world of of technology and, and those that are helping uh, power our world. So uh, we are glad you're here, and we're certainly going to get to our guest in just a little bit. But before we do, uh, as always, we're going to go ahead and bring in Shelby Dumaine to talk about how you can not only be a part of the conversation, but uh, also we're going to have uh, our weekly uh, trivia segment as well. So hey, Shelby, good to see you. Hey, Michael, it's great to see you as well. Uh, yeah, so there's a couple different ways that our audience and everybody watching at home can get a hold of us. If you have a question for um, us at any point, for Michael or for our guests, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, you can comment those questions below. Uh, so yeah, we'll be. I'm in the comment section the entire show, whether you're on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube. I'm there. Comment your question. We're going to get to as many uh, uh, of those comments and questions at the end of the show as we can during that Q and A. Uh, there's also a couple different ways you can get a hold of us after the show. So you have more comments, you have something else to add, uh, or even an idea for a future show. There, there's a few other ways you can get in contact us, with us as well. Uh, the first way is you can email us at socialmedia at NOV.com. So you can send us a quick message there and, and we check that inbox every day. Uh, you can also give us a call. So we have a, a new a phone number and call and leave us a voicemail. If you'd like to stay anonymous, you can. If, if you want to give us your name and title, then we can feature you on the show as well. And that number is 346-223-4799. So it's on the screen now. Uh, we would absolutely love to hear from you. So going along with comments, you know, we, we love for you to send in your questions. But now is for the time in the show where we ask you a question. So it's time for Rig Geeks. Rig Geeks, post of the week. All right, so this week we got a really good question for you. I'm, I'm interested to see if anyone can um, get this answer. So we're talking about pad drilling throughout the show. And so our question for today is, what percentage of wells in the Eagleford and Bakken region are drilled using pad drilling? If you think you know the answer, you can give an approximation of of uh, what percentage of wells in the Eagleford and Bakken region are drilled using pad drilling. If you think you know it, go ahead and comment down below. And uh, we are gonna check out the answer at the end of the show to see how many of our rig geeks out there in the comments uh, got that correct. Uh, so now we'll head back to Michael. All right, so we'll we'll see. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a huge trivia fan, which is why one of the reasons I love this. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely give us your, your comments and let's see. See what we get. So great. Well, thanks, Shelby. All right. So uh, as we talked about at the top of the show, and as Shelby just mentioned, we're talking uh, about some innovative technology that is really helping uh, uh, really, really transform the space, uh, especially when you're looking at pad drilling and, and how uh, once you have some of the uh, wellheads completed there, how that can uh, impact your, your drilling operations. So we're gonna go ahead and bring in our guest today. So we've got Mr. Greg White, who is the director of Seller Tech Products here at NOV. So, uh, hey, Greg, thanks for joining us. Hey, good morning, how you doing? Good, good. So, uh, you know, so we've been talking about Seller Tech uh, and, and maybe just to kind of get folks a high level before we start getting into to some of the the Q and A. So, Seller Tech, can you give us a quick uh, quick background on on the the technology and and what uh, what some of the uh, uh, products and, and technologies that uh, Seller Tech provides? Sure, uh, Seller Tech's about fourteen years old. We were purchased by NOV about two years ago. We were uh, founded in Alaska out of a need. We were founded by a drilling engineer that was having uh, just a host of problems with. Um, it, just about any time he came on to new well, uh, sellers failing or filling a pool of water or, or uh, contamination issues. And so he kind of had built there had to be a better way. So we developed the uh, seller tech containment well sellers. Uh, since then, they've spread to Appalachia, West Texas, New Mexico, uh, other areas, and continue to spread more every day. And basically, uh, it's a uh, it's a whole different way to go about pad drilling. The difference between 
um, using our sellers for pad drilling and pad drilling the conventional way with a 10 horn or a regular standard seller or even a concrete seller is night and day. Uh, we also manufacture and uh, install casing hangers for surface casing and spud risers. Okay. Riders. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really good. So, uh, so I mean, when folks, you know, those that uh, may have heard uh, of Seller Tech or, or some of the the uh, offerings that that you all are providing, or maybe they've even seen the the website on on NLV's website, they they may have heard the the idea or seen you know below grade uh, containment well sellers, and they're like, okay, yeah, that might be a, a mouthful for some. So. Uh, for those that might not be familiar, can you kind of talk through that? I mean, what what is that, and why why do you need uh, uh, below grade containment well sellers specifically? Sure. So uh, for all the gains that comes with pad drilling, there's a lot of uh, trade off. There's a lot of hurdles to get over, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pain to deal with. Uh, one of those is production facilities, and especially if an operator is going to return to pad and drill a new well on a uh, existing pad, um, getting around existing wellheads, existing infrastructure, uh, flow lines, artificial lift lines, whatever, um, it can be a big hassle. So, you know, sellers have always been kind of this hole in the ground that drilling has to have to house the wellhead so you can stack a BOP on top and still stack a rig over the top of that. Um, and what we do is we take a uh, we take a different approach to it, and we get everything that we can, or really the wellhead, the tree, all production flow lines, everything we can below grade, so that uh, the operator can produce all their uh, all their wells below grade, so that whenever they return to pad, they can maximize their drilling operations uh, by being able to return to pad, and every uh, every new well that they drill on an existing pad is like the very first well on that pad. Mm -hmm. They don't have to worry about uh, production trees sticking up, flow lines having to disconnect anything, TNA wells, uh, anything like that. They can come back to the pad, rig right up on their new well, uh, drill it while producing on the pad with their existing wells, um, and have a good operational area for uh, simultaneous, excuse me, have a good efficient area for simultaneous operations, return to pad drilling. It also uh, increases their level of environmental stewardship and it can cut down on their construction costs by uh, a lot of operators haven't done something like this in the past where they haven't drilled a lot of pads with a lot of wells on it because uh, returning to pad was such a, a big issue and they had to get molecules and pipeline. So the, the alternative was either to draw all the wells at once and tie up the rig for a long time or return to pad later. Um, by being able to do that, by being able to use our system, return to pad and have below grade, uh, op, uh, below grade production and simultaneous operations, we've got a lot of operators that are able to drill and, uh, a whole lot of wells, 60 plus wells on one pad, which cuts them down significantly uh on their uh, pad construction cost to build bigger uh, one big pad instead of a whole lot of small pads so they save significantly on their facilities cost and that's all due to below grade production right right so um you know i know we're gonna dive into some of the the benefits and this this might kind of be a a lead into that but you know the the graphic we just showed was i thought really innovative really compelling but you know it's kind of like okay well help help give me some context so if I didn't have, uh, you know, a below grade well seller, you know, what, what would I be looking at? And, you know, what would be some of the, maybe some of the, the drawbacks if I'm not using a, a, a solution like the, the seller tech uh, technologies here? Sure. So, you know, some drawbacks with regular pad drilling, like, a, like we, uh, like we just discussed, basically, you know, when an operator comes back to location, if they got existing wells on that pad, they either have to build the pad large enough and spread out their well heads to where uh, they don't interfere with existing uh, existing uh, production, or they'll go in there if the pad's not large enough. Say you're in Appalachia where your pad size is really small because you're drilling on the side of the mountain. You can't build a huge pad with big step outs and big, uh, big well head spacing. Uh, you're going to have to go in there, TA the well, which is a very expensive proposition. Uh, it could be $100,000 plus. And you're going to lose all that production whenever you return to pad. So the the cost trade off for that, uh, and we even have operators in the Permian that are the same thing. You would think that you would never run out of land to build drilling pads out in West Texas, New Mexico, but that's exactly what's happening. 
And so we've got operators that are coming to us and saying, either I cannot build all the pads that I need to build um, without using your technology, or uh, I'm going to have to build these humongous pads with a lot of wells on it. And whenever I return to pad, I'm going to have to start TA, uh, TA and wells and losing out on production. And that can be $200,000 per well uh, for every time you return to pad and have to TA that well. So it's a very expensive proposition to do it the old way. And like I said, it was a, a pain that people had to deal with. There was really no alternative. And then uh, we started working with operators to uh, come up with a better way to do things. So, you know, you and you, you did highlight some of the, those benefits, SimOps, and, you know, of course, uh, increased uh, efficiencies in terms of uh, pad spacing. So maybe we can kind of dive into, you know, some of the other benefits that, uh, you know, those that are looking for a solution, maybe an operator is really looking to, to maximize uh, their investment. Uh, what are some of the other benefits that uh, uh, end users can see using some of the, the seller tech uh, solutions? So it, um, besides the below grade production, it leads to uh, a, a better and more efficient way to return to pads, simultaneous operations, and increase in production by not having to shut in wells on existing uh, on existing production whenever operators return. Uh, some of the big uh, some of the big features are the uh, it eliminates the hurdles that are you know typically encountered with uh, trying to go below grade. So even if you were trying to go below grade without these systems. Uh, the hurdles usually outweigh the, the benefit. The, uh, the standard containment well seller uh, has, is also, uh, as, as in the name implies, contained. So basically anything that falls in the cellar or flows into the cellar or whatever uh, stays in the cellar. So uh, in this environmental age, you know, soil contamination and um, uh, environmental impact are a big, a big deal mm -hmm. for operators. All of our mm -hmm. cellars are fully 100% seam welded. Uh, they even weld around a conductor in a mouse hole, and all flow lines coming in and out of the cellar are also sealed. So the cellar itself is 100% sealed, so it can be used as a containment berm or a containment pit mm -hmm. on location. But uh, even when the wells put into production down the line, uh, if something were to leak on the wellhead or the tree, which is not an uncommon occurrence, uh, that well is uh, that well that spill is contained. Uh, it also increases the uh, level of environmental, or excuse me, the uh, the safety. Or in and around the cellar, uh, we address things like confined space entry. We uh, we have uh, rescue apparatuses for whenever the the cellar becomes a confined space entry uh, area, and we can really address all the the standard HSE concerns that uh, originate in and around a cellar. Which on a on a drilling rig, if you look at the uh, OSHA recordable incidents, about twenty percent of all OSHA recordable incidents on a, on a drill pad are, are usually in and around the cellar. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So really it sounds like, uh, this is, this has multiple advantages, not only from, uh, like you said, an operational efficiency standpoint, but certainly from a safety standpoint, I know that's, uh, that's definitely top of mind for, for all of us. Um, so I kind of wanted to pivot maybe over a little bit and talk about, uh, some of the other products that, uh, you and the team, uh, have worked to bring to market. I know that you've got uh, some casing hangers and, and spud risers as, as well, right? Correct, yeah. Uh, the casing hangers work well in conjunction with our uh, the structural floor, the, the, the base plate of our cellar. In a lot of areas like, say, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, you'll have a, a fair amount of waiting on cement time. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, very, uh, it's very constricted by the, uh, the local environmental regulations. Uh, you also see it in places like New Mexico. Um, every every state in the U.S. and I'm sure just about everywhere around the world has really you know strict and and, and laid out uh, waiting on cement time uh, regulations for operators whenever they set in cement surface casing. Um, our basically the advantage of our casing hanger is it lands into a landing ring that welds on the conductor, and all the weight of your surface casing, your wellhead. Uh, your BOP, your drill out forces, they're all carried by the, the structural floor of the cellar. And many states have allowed for an alternative method to WOC time uh, by using our casing hanger. And that is a, uh, it's something that can be used with an off the shelf type wellhead. A lot of times if an operator were to go 
to a, a wellhead provider and say they wanted to do something like this, it, it comes at a significant cost. They can't use a uh, they can't use a, a standard what we would call a commodity off the shelf uh, wellhead. Mm -hmm. They can do that with our system. Uh, lands in seconds. There's no special tools or anything. You can run your wellhead through the rotary table, um, and uh, allows for a 360 degree orientation. The wellhead we have a latching model. If an operator is worried about packing off or uh, their surface case becoming buoyant inside the uh, the hole. Um, and while it's a bold claim, we've also been able to do a study with operators in the Northeast and Appalachia and prove that our surface casing hanger system can eliminate shallow gas migration. Again, that's a bold wow. claim. We have the data to back that up and right. Right. that can be a significant thing. Uh, operators have been fined as much as $750,000 for shallow gas migration on their wells up in the Northeast. We can eliminate that. Mm. Uh, we have a track record of doing so. The, uh, the quick connect spud riser. Uh, also rigs up and down in minutes, uh, allows for 360 degree orientation of the, uh, the riser. It, um, it allows for the, uh, for batch setting the surface casing. Uh, we have a, we have a, uh, it's a quick connect model. Again, it rigs up and down in minutes. There's no special tools or anything. It, uh, it latches onto the landing ring that the surface casing hanger lands inside of, uh, rigs up and down in minutes. It has a, a mid-level, uh, quick connect for uh, for doing your rough cut at grade. Uh, it's really a good product. We've had a lot of these out in the field. Um, they are rig specific, but it can save about two hours of rig time. And uh, so in conjunction with the surface casing hanger, which can save about eight hours or more of rig time, depending on your regulations, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the whole system can save about 10 hours of, uh, of rig time. Wow. Wow. So, so it sounds like, I mean, to, to your point, I mean, these are, are not only innovative and, and, um, and really, uh, I, I think a kind of a creative solution for some of these problems, but, uh, really can, can help the overall, uh, effectiveness, efficiency, and, and like you said, safety of, uh, operations. So, um, that, that's, that's, uh, like you said, some, some bold claims, but certainly, uh, some, some cases to certainly, back those up. If if you're just joining us, um, we are talking with Mr. Greg White. Uh, he is the director of Seller Tech Products here at NOV. And uh, we've been talking about uh, the uh, Seller Tech uh, below grade containment well sellers, as well as uh, some of the casing hangers and spud risers uh, that uh, the team has uh, been able to bring to market. So uh, if you've had any questions or if anything Greg has said, has kind of sparked uh, a a question in in your head. Don't don't feel bashful. Feel free to go ahead and put that in the comment section. Whether you're watching us on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube, and uh, and we'll get to your question uh, in just a couple moments. So, uh, Greg, I, I wanted to maybe pivot back over to you. I'm just kind of curious. You know, you've you've been in in this this game for for quite a while, and one of the things that I always like. Um, is is kind of hearing sort of firsthand uh, uh, kind of story retelling of of you know when you're able to talk to customers, especially after they've been able to to you know install a a a well seller or one, or one of the the seller tech well sellers. Uh, I'm not certainly not ask you to to name names, but you know as as you've kind of experienced that, what have been some of the what's been some of the feedback that that you've gotten? I'm sure it's it's uh, it's it's interesting. Yeah, so it is one of the, you know, the interesting things is uh, about seller tech and about our products is that I'd say that we probably, again, another bold claim, but we have about 100% satisfaction rate with our customers. We've never had an operator that has started using our products and then just stopped. Um, it becomes a uh, it becomes a set in place way of doing things for them. Uh, we've never had anybody that's, you know, come back and said, you know, this just isn't for us. And and, um, and and we need to go back to the old way of doing things. So that, that says a lot about the product. Um, there's not a whole lot of you know stuff out there that you can say that has 100% satisfaction rate with the sure. customer, with an operator, with any operator, and within any region too. And we have we have major operators that use this product um, in multiple fields, multiple regions. We also have uh, we have very a whole lot of independent, smaller type operators that use this and some of them use it on hundred percent of their pads. Some of them use it on certain pads that are, that fall within a, a scope of, uh, of what they determine to be needed. And uh, 
So we also like to tell people it's not for everybody, but the, the people that it can help is significantly helps them. It adds a lot to their, uh, right. adds a lot to their operational efficiency. It cuts a lot of cost out. And, uh, if you were to compare it to say a regular standard, what we call it, like I said, a tin horn, which is a piece of culver pipe seller. Um, if you were to look at it just dollar to dollar, the cost is a lot higher. But uh, as we discussed earlier, the operational goals, or excuse me, the operational efficiency gains are, are tremendous for an operator. Right. We have one operator um, that estimated that just in the first year of, of installing the sellers for them out in West Texas, that they increased production the following year by not having to shut in wells by 2%. And that doesn't sound like a big number, you know, 2%. Mm. But if you look at how many barrels of oil a day that that operator produces and the cost of a barrel of oil, even at $45 a barrel, uh, it's over five hundred million dollars worth of savings for that mm -hmm. that one operator just for installing mm -hmm. about uh, forty of our sellers a year. Right, uh, it's a big deal. Right, uh, and, and like I keep saying, you know, the, the difference between uh, standard pad drilling and what we do is nine day. It's a major shift for the operator. There's a lot of work that goes into it between us and dealing with the operator. Uh, a lot of back and forth, a lot of design changes, but we uh, we definitely get them there. We walk them through the whole process. And um, we get them to a point in uh, in their pad drilling operations to where they can really look back and say that they, would, they wish they would have done this years ago. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I think that's that's a testament to the uh, the technical uh, collaboration and certainly communication that uh, I know you and the team as well as uh, the team and and the customers have. So uh, certainly uh, excited to to hear those those comments. Um, speaking of comments, we're going to go ahead and uh, bring in Shelby Dumain to uh, get some of the questions that folks have uh, put in the chat in Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, and uh, and get those over to uh, to Greg. So, hey, Shelby. Hey, Michael, and uh, hey, Greg. So, this first question comes from Facebook, and uh, comment was wondering: uh, Can operators using um, uh, sorry, can can operate can an operator of standard pads switch to below grade? Sure. So, um, kind of a two part question, but basically, if if an operator is using standard pads, of course they can switch, and that's I'm assuming that they mean just starting with a new pad. But I think what they may be asking is if an operator has an existing well on an existing pad or existing wells on existing pads, would they be able to switch to this technology? The answer is yes. Uh, we've done that for multiple operators in the Northeast. We've also done it uh, on the Permian as well, where an operator uh, drilled a well, drilled two wells, drilled however many wells on a pad and decided later uh, that they needed to put more wells on that pad and that the, the cost of shutting in those wells was going to be so high and that the, the pad restriction whenever they returned the pad was going to be uh, um, inefficient enough to where they wanted to use our systems. We've gone in there and we have uh, we have retrofitted existing wells to be able to accept our sellers uh, and got their existing wellheads below grade. There's a couple different ways we do that. It's dependent on each uh, each we kind of have to look at it a case by case scenario but absolutely there's there's definitely ways to do it so one of the things that we get asked a lot is well I, you know i, I want to do this but i've already got a bunch of wells drilled on pads and and so I've, they feel like they've already kind of you know painted themselves in a corner and so that's a great question because it's actually not the case we can we can retrofit existing wells existing pads uh to utilize our sellers and still have all the operational uh benefits mm -hmm. Great, it's very interesting. Uh, so this next question comes from Curtis uh, on LinkedIn, and I know we can't, you know, necessarily always get into the super super specifics, but can you talk about uh, different regions of the world where this technology is being used? So right now, uh, I can tell you that the uh, the technology is not being used in Kuwait or Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got a couple different operators that are uh, that are looking to use it in those regions. We we spoke with them. Um, it's, it's something where looking at their, um, uh, looking at their existing wells and what they do now, um, I can tell you with a, a pretty good degree of certainty that it would be very beneficial for us to, uh, to, excuse me, very beneficial for an operator to be utilizing our systems over there. Um, don't want to get too far into the weeds as far as, as why that is, uh, cause then again, it might also kind of call out specific operators. Um, but 
currently we do not have any sellers installed in those areas, but I would say that they are an area after looking and, and talking with some operators over there that uh, would be very beneficial for, for utilizing our systems. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, so here we have this uh, next question I'd like to ask. Can you talk a little bit more about how the system is actually implemented? Sure. Uh, so one thing I like to tell people is that we don't have an off the shelf seller. We don't, we don't go to operators and say, um, here's our box and make your operations and, and trim your operational goals and, and, uh, and change things to fit in our box. We change our box to fit the operator. And so when I first started doing this, I thought that uh, much like a lot of other activities when it comes to joining completions production, there'd be a lot of standardization across the field and there's some, but there's not as much as you would think. Uh, so we have, we have a lot of staff that uh, basically what we do is we go in there, we work with the operator. We have initial meetings typically with either somebody in drilling or completions or production. Uh, we, we get an idea of what they're looking to do. We, we talk to them about their operational goals for the field, what they're going to be doing, how they're going to be producing their wells, um, just a whole host of questions. And then we take that and we, we go back into our internal uh, uh, meeting and we come back and we suggest to them some, some ideas of what we think that it would look like. We also work with the wellhead operator. We take the drawing of the wellhead. We model it inside the cellar. We do all that for them. And then it'll be a bunch of back and forth meetings. There'll be some risk assessments. Uh, and basically we arrive at a standard design. And once that design is, uh, is established and we, we feel that it's gonna, it's gonna meet all their, uh, their wants and needs and goals, uh, we'll go forward with uh, hopefully mm -hmm. manufacturing product for them. Um, everything's made right now. Everything's made in Kansas and the USA. Uh, we hotly galvanize everything for corrosion resistance so that when it goes into the ground, whether it be in Appalachia or West Texas or Colorado or California, we have good corrosion resistance on the sellers. Uh, everything's made in the USA. It's made to the operator's spec. And uh, as I said, we, we, have a, we, we do an exhaustive amount of meetings with the operator to make sure that the seller fits their needs and not the other way around. We don't want them to have to trim their trim their goals or change their operations to fit uh, into our product as much as possible. And, um, and I think we do a, a really good job of that. And it takes a while. Um, some operators can take three months and sometimes I've got one right now that I think we're on year two of the development process, but uh, in the end, it's really worth it for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, this next question comes from Cody on LinkedIn and he's wondering, would an operator be able to decrease their well spacing? Absolutely. That's that's one of the big reasons. Uh, in a nutshell, that's one of the big reasons why we have a lot of operators using this out in like West Texas, where, like I said, you think that you wouldn't run out of room in West Texas to drill wells and build huge pads, but sometimes you do, um, especially if you're, say, in New Mexico on BLM land or in Colorado on BLM land or North Dakota on BLM land. Uh, BLM can be... Um, you know, they, they have their goals and they don't necessarily always align with an operator. So they'll tell the operator, you have to put so many wells in, in such a such an area and they do what's called a drill island. And they'll give them a space and say, you have to drill, you know, your full section of wells in this area. And uh, the operator may look at it and say, you know, I don't have enough room to do 30, 40 foot wellhead spacing, which their production uh, team may be asking for later on for either artificial lift or a uh, work over reasons. And so they need to have a way to be able to uh, shrink their wellhead space into basically the footprint of their operations uh, while at the same time not um, not decreasing their, decreasing their operational efficiency. So in the past without seller tech, what that meant was you had a sellers or sellers, excuse me, and you had wells that were say at 10, 20 foot well space. And anytime you had to do really anything on a well, whether it be drill new wells next to adjacent uh, producing wells or come in with a workover rig or stubbing unit, whatever, uh, getting back onto those existing wells was pretty hard. And uh, there was a lot of, like we keep saying, there's a lot of hurdles to that and a lot of, uh, a lot of cost in, involved with that. Uh, our product by getting those wellheads below grade, by being able to cover the cellar with a cover plate that can withstand the loads of whatever they're going to throw on top of it, 
Uh, and we and again, we engineer that. We take into account what that operator is going to need down the road. And they tell us, and we design that uh, system for them. They're able to come back to the pad, get right up on that well, as if it was 50 feet from the well next door when it may only be 10 or 12 feet away. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this next question is from Justin on uh, LinkedIn as well. And he's wondering, can you install sellers next to wells on the same pad without retrofitting um, or executing a work over on the existing wellhead or tree? Sure. Uh, so that goes into what I was just talking about. Uh, we have different styles of sellers. We have a what we call a type A geometry and a type B. Uh, type A is where you have a uh, your trees is above grade, uh, but all your production is below grade. You produ you're producing lines, your wellhead, and your tubing is below grade. Uh, we also have uh, those are more individual sellers. We also have trench style sellers where all your wellheads are uh in a common trench and um and usually with those it's completely below grade what we call b geometry uh so to the the question that kind of just feeds into the last one we had but basically uh yeah you can you can come in cover the cellar if you're in a b geometry type situation add a new well work over a well whatever uh, likewise if you're in, in an a geometry uh situation where your tubing has below grade um that differs from a regular well site in that typically they'll put their tubing head above grade so they can have access to their casing valves. And whenever they return a pad, they can, uh, they have to TA the well, which uh, we talked about earlier is about a hundred thousand dollar exercise. Uh, with having the tubing head below grade, they can come back, take the tree off, put a nightcap on top of the tubing head, uh, cover the cellar. And that's about a $12,000, 10 to 12, maybe 15, depending on the area. Uh, thousand dollar operation and they have their they have their complete unrestricted pad access they can go right next to the existing well uh do whatever they need to do uh safely efficiently and then come back off the pad and go back into production uh likewise with our trench sellers we sell them or excuse me we manufacture and uh design a modular seller to where if somebody wanted to come in and add on to an existing well row, uh, they can do so easily. It's just a matter of excavating, removing an in-wall plate, adding new cellars, drilling new wells, and uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very, very easy and turnkey for the operator. Yeah, right. Um, so this last question comes uh, from LinkedIn, and, I, and then this is going to be our last one just for time. I appreciate everyone's comments and questions. They, they've been really great. Uh, but, but Mr. Zala was wondering, what should the minimum distance between two wells be or two sellers considering all safety standards? So that's a loaded question because that's gonna be really, uh, that's gonna be really determined by the operator and by a few things, but mainly, uh, you know, drilling is gonna have anti-collision issues, uh, production or completions may have, uh, you know, their own, um, their own reasons why they need certain wellhead spacing uh, just in the drilling phase and then later on uh, for production, they're going to be worried about, you know, it, it, there's a lot of difference between, say, okay, a well in Appalachia where I can, say, have it down to a seven and a half foot, 10 foot wellhead spacing and be able to accomplish that fairly easily. You can't have that wellhead spacing down, say, in uh, Midland, Texas, where you're going to have to put a rod pump on that well someday. You won't have enough room. So artificial lift comes into play. The actual uh, the uh, stack up of the wellhead and tree and how how, how your weave valves and uh, if you have any actually weave valves chokes uh, instrumentation and INE is going to come off that uh, wellhead. So uh, it really I guess sorry the the nutshell answer is that is really a function of where you're drilling wells, the operator, their op their uh, their operations, how they're going to drill the well, stuff like that. But I'll suffice it to say, in the Permian, we've seen down as uh, down as low as 15 feet up in Appalachia. We've seen seven and a half feet, 10 feet, Alaska, seven and a half feet, 10 feet, uh, really low wellhead spacing. Uh, it's all a function of where you're drilling and uh, what your future operations are going to uh, look like. And again, uh, we'll work with the operator to help them get to that number with uh, by leaning and using our experience and doing this in the past for other operators. And uh, I think that we can really help people get to a, a good answer that works for every discipline within their, mm -hmm. uh, so, within their organization. It sounds like, so it sounds like uh, your, your answer was the, uh, the one that I, I uh, never liked in, in school is like, well, what's the answer? Well, it depends. So, so yeah. but that's, that's fair. That's, that's fair. So 
Uh, great. Well, thanks, uh, uh, Greg. That, that has been really, really good. I know it's sometimes a little challenging to kind of take these rapid fire, but I know our, our viewers really appreciate the opportunity to to uh, certainly rapid fire those, those questions. So if we didn't get to your question today or if there were, was a, a question or, or a comment that, that you had that you wanted to share with Greg, we are certainly happy to get that. So you can email uh, Greg. Uh, we'll actually, let's see, we'll get his email. There it is. So greg.white at NOV.com. You can send him a note. Or if you'd like to look at some additional uh, uh, information on the Seller Tech uh, Solutions, you can go to NOV.com slash forward slash Seller Tech. And uh, there you can find additional information and uh, and can click the contact us button on the bottom if you'd like Greg or someone from his team to reach out to you. So Greg, uh, Greg White with uh, the Seller Tech team, appreciate you being here and uh, talking with us today. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's a lot of information to go over. It's uh, kind of like taking a sip of water through a fire hydrant, but uh, through my information out there, I'd love to talk with anybody that uh, may be interested. Absolutely. Thanks, Great. Thanks, Greg. All right. Well, we're going to get back over to Shelby Dumain to get the answer for the Rig Geeks post of the week. So for those that uh, may have jumped in right after uh, you gave the question. Let's uh, give that to him again, Shelby. Maybe they can uh, kind of at home, uh, maybe challenge themselves, see if they can come up with the answer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that question again was, what percentage of wells in the Eagleford and Bakken region are drilled using pad drilling? Uh, so I saw a lot of really great guesses out there. Um, mm -hmm. Some got it, I'd say, right around, right up to 2% off from, from the answer that we have. Uh, which is the percentage of wells in the Eagleford and Bakken regions that are drilled using pad drilling. Uh, we have is approximately 75%. Oh, okay. Um, cool. Yeah. We, we also do have a little fun fact. If you're wondering about the Appalachia area, we have that as at 90% using um, mm. uh, pad drilling. Mm. Man, I, uh, I, my, my numbers are way off. So I'm, I'm glad that I don't, uh, I don't have to put a number in that, but that's, that's good. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Shelby, for uh, for helping us there. And uh, certainly want to thank everyone for uh, taking uh, time out of your schedule to join us here on NOV Live. We are always happy to have you and look forward to additional opportunities to share uh, subject matter experts and the technologies that are helping shape uh, the world uh, of oil and gas and energy uh, around the world. So from all of us here at NOV, thank you for watching and for listening. And we'll talk to you later.